The information in the HIB-91 video has been replaced by the publication Building Component Safety Information, BCSI 1-03, the truss industry's new guide for handling, installing, and bracing wood trusses. Please contact WTCA to obtain your copy. A popular fad a few years ago was to arrange dominoes into intricate designs, then watch them fall. It was fun and innocent, and no one was hurt. But if roof trusses are not braced properly, they can also go down like dominoes, and the result can be costly, even tragic. The space in the middle of these fallen trusses is where lumber had to be cut out to reach a worker who was killed in the accident. The purpose of this video is to help prevent such accidents. Metal plate connected wood trusses are used in more than 65% of all housing being built in the United States today. That's because they have many advantages over conventional stick-by-stick -stick framing. Structures can be enclosed more quickly with trusses, saving time on the job site. And trusses can span long distances without support, allowing for large open space rooms and great flexibility of floor plans. That's why they are often used in churches where scissors trusses allow the space to soar upward. Trusses are pre-engineered, so there's no guesswork on site. And since they are manufactured products, they assure consistent quality for faster construction and a uniform appearance. And trusses perform very well when they are used properly. Trusses come in many shapes and sizes but they're all based on the rigid triangle, the most efficient geometric shape for carrying and transferring loads in a structure. That's easy to see here where the overall triangle is made up of several smaller triangles. Even these floor trusses get their strength from the many triangle shapes inside that help bear the load. A truss is a manufactured assembly of many parts, not a single solid piece like a sawn 2 by 10 because of this, the individual parts, wood cords, wood webs, and metal connector plates can be damaged if mishandled. To help serve as a guide to the proper handling, installing, and bracing wood trusses, the Truss Plate Institute has published the booklet HIB-91 for use by truss installers, contractors, and builders of record. At the manufacturing plant, Trusses should be banded as close to panel points as possible to prevent bending of the lumber. Standard practice is to load banded truss bundles on the bed of the trailer, then securely fasten them down for transport to the job site. An inexpensive summary of this information is often shipped with truss packages by truss manufacturers. WTCA has also produced this poster showing pertinent HIB 91 recommendations. Many contractors posted in the on-site trailer or other locations frequented by those who handle trusses. Trusses should be unloaded in bundles and on relatively smooth ground. Rough terrain can cause distortion of the metal plate connected joints 
or damage to other parts of the truss. Trusses stored horizontally should be supported on blocking to prevent excessive bending and keep them off wet ground. Trusses to be stored on site for a long time should be protected from the rain and make sure they have adequate ventilation. Here is an accident waiting to happen. In this position, the bundle could easily topple, damaging the trusses and resulting in injury to workers. It is the responsibility of the installer to select the most suitable method and sequence of installation. He should be knowledgeable about the truss drawings, truss placement plans, and all notes and cautions. The installer should clarify any questions with the truss manufacturer before installation. He should provide a forklift or a crane with slings, tag lines, and spreader bars for sufficient control during lifting and placement. Determine the proper location of lift points and the type of rigging and procedure that will assure truss balance. The use of tag lines to help control the truss is recommended whenever trusses are lifted using a crane. For trusses spanning 30 to 60 feet, a suggested lifting procedure to use is a spreader bar that is extended to approximately one-half to two-thirds the length of the truss. For example, here we have a 44-foot scissors cantilever truss. A note of caution, the lines from the ends of the spreader bar should toe in as they do here. Don't let them toe out since this will tend to cause buckling of the truss. The tag line is very important for maintaining control of the truss during the erection process. This ensures that the truss will remain plumb and the job site will remain safe. When each member of the installation team is knowledgeable about safe erection procedures, the trusses can be set on the building easily and quickly. Large trusses require the most planning and attention before lifting. Because of their size, this plus 60 footer weighs 350 pounds. Improper rigging or lifting could cause serious damage and injuries. With truss spans greater than 60 feet, the suggested lifting procedure requires the use of a strong back as shown here. It should be attached to the top cord and web members at intervals of approximately 10 feet and it should be at or above the mid-height of the truss to prevent overturning. The strong back should have sufficient strength to safely carry the weight of the truss and sufficient rigidity to adequately resist the bending of the truss. After deciding how to lift the trusses into place, the next step is to brace them. The importance of proper and complete bracing cannot be stressed too strongly. By far the greatest number of serious injuries and deaths involving trusses occur because of inadequate bracing. Here is a recreation of an actual accident caused by improper top cord bracing that resulted in serious life-threatening injuries to three men. This 60-foot, 490-pound truss did not have enough braces and was attached very poorly to the next truss. For the test, buckets weighing the same as each man were suspended from the bottom cord. First, one man stepped onto the bottom cord. Then, another. Note the characteristic S-shape of the top cord of the truss. This S-shape is a dangerous action that proper bracing is meant to prevent. Finally, the weight of the third flipped the truss. That's why bracing is so important in fact, even the bracing should be braced. This is a model of a trussed roof with all the temporary and permanent bracing already installed.
Kirk Grundahl, Executive Director of WTCA, explains the purpose of each kind of bracing and the installation sequence. The key to uh, bracing off the truss system is getting the ground bracing set up properly. Make sure that the first truss is plumb. You want to have a right angle from the ground to the first truss. And then you want this diagonal to tie off the system in a triangulated fashion to make, it, make the entire system stable. From there, you're going to have these ground braces periodically placed, again, for, for stability uh, purposes with the first truss. The first ground brace is attached to the center of the truss, right at the center, and then each additional ground, brace are, ground braces are spaced from there. And then you brace the bracing off with these diagonal braces to each of the ground braces that have been set up. And you want this to triangulate out as well, and again, increase the stability of the system. And finally, you want to attach your ground braces to a, a ground stake that's driven properly into the ground and deep enough to hold the entire system up so that you do have stability for each truss that you add uh, as you erect the trusses and set the entire truss roof system. For multi-story buildings, the trusses above must be braced to the floor below as shown in this graphic. So the next thing, once the ground bracing is up and the first truss is plumb, you have the lateral bracing, which is designated by this orange colored piece here, in at least 10 foot lengths, connected with two 16 penny duplex nails at every point. And then there's a lap joint, turn around here, right there, that you lap at least two trusses, again, for stability purposes. You don't want to have just one connection where it can rotate. You want it lapped over so you have continuous, uh, di or continuous lateral bracing that's temporary. And this will always be put down and then taken off when the sheathing's put on. Attached to that is diagonal bracing, which is designated by this orange piece. Um, and that ties off the system so it's entirely stable uh, temporarily. And this can be left in the configuration that it's in as a permanent brace to the system. Uh, right after the temporary lateral bracing on the top cord is placed, oftentimes the temporary bracing that becomes permanent on the bottom cord is placed at about 10 foot on center for HIV requirements. This bracing is placed, and again, you have a lap joint much the, as the same, much the same as the top cord. And you also then diagonally brace this off, both, which is noticeable over here, as well as between the braces in the center of the trusses. And again, that's to tie the entire system off. All of this bracing ends up being minimum two by four uh, grade stamped lumber. One of the last bracing pieces that is put into a system is the web member bracing, and this is to prevent web buckling in the system. This bracing is shown by this red 2x4 laterally, braces each web member, uh, and is shown on the truss design drawing specifically. In some cases, a single uh, brace is necessary, and in other cases, two braces are necessary to keep the webs from buckling out of plane. Once that lateral bracing is put on to prevent that buckling, periodically throughout the truss system, a diagonal brace is placed to again tie that system together so that all the webs and that lateral brace don't buckle together and actually cause the truss to move out of plane. One of the final elements to bracing off the entire roof system is the permanent cross bracing. You'll notice that this bracing starts at the top cord and goes diagonally to the bottom cord. And that's to tie the entire system together. You'll run your wind forces or your lateral bracing forces into the top cord diaphragm and into the bottom cord diaphragm. So never forget to brace the bracing. This is also very important for floor truss construction. As can be seen, the same principles apply. 
long 2x4 lateral and diagonal bracing. Floor trusses are much easier to handle and work with than roof trusses. You will use blocking and band boards to transfer loads and provide a stable floor system. Finally, a strong back brace strengthens the floor and ties the floor system together as a single unit. In some cases, alternatives to using lumber floor bracing may be desired. Shown here is one of the alternatives that can provide a safe method of bracing. If tools such as this are used, they should be augmented with properly designed diagonal bracing cross bracing, round bracing, and similar items to hold the trusses in a stable condition. Never stack material on unbraced or inadequately braced trusses, nor near the peak, nor on cantilevered trusses, and never overload single or small groups of trusses. Position the load over as many trusses as possible. Wood trusses can carry great loads because they are based on the rigid triangle shape, but handling wood trusses requires a high degree of safety awareness. It is essential that prudent and proper methods be used at all times. And remember, brace the bracing. Anyone involved with handling or installing wood trusses should obtain a copy of HIB 91 and refer to it whenever trusses are to be installed. That way, these will be the only kind of dominoing we will want to see.